This video is going to cover the first of our three general steps for our AC to DC conversion. And so of course that first step, as we said in our previous video, was rectifying the signal. And so this rectification video should mostly be a review from topics we've already covered in analog devices, um, but I would encourage you to watch it just to make sure we're all on the same page. So we're going to consider four different circuits. And so I believe three of them we've seen before, one might be new, but it's going to be the same basic ideas. And so for all of these circuits, we're going to assume we have the same input sinusoidal wave just to make things easier. So let's just say all have the same input. And so what that input is going to look like is this right here. So I just have some generalized sine wave, which has a peak voltage VP. Uh, we see it's going down to negative VP, uh, so the difference of the two would be our peak to peak. And you see I've labeled a T and a T over 2, so of course T is our period, and T over 2 is just half of that period, and of course remember the period is half of, or sorry not the half, the, the time it takes for the waveform to start repeating itself. Um, one other thing to recall too is in some of these definitions I'm going to be talking about RMS voltage. So remember for a sine wave our VRMS is the peak voltage divided by the square root of 2 and of course we can flip that around to say our peak voltage is just root 2 times VRMS. Okay, so with all of that in mind let's move on to our first of four circuits, our half wave rectifier. And so we can see our half wave rectifier here is just a single diode and a load resistor. And so I've defined our output voltage as being across that load resistor. And we have this VAC input, which let me be clear and just label this as our VAC right here. Okay, so we've input this blue waveform. And so essentially we know what's gonna happen is this diode is only going to let current flow in this direction. So during our positive half cycle, our current is going to be allowed to flow and we're going to get the same thing that we had for the input waveform so it'll look something like this. However when we go to the negative half cycle D1 will be reverse biased and we'll essentially have zero current in the circuit. Uh, we'll have some reverse saturation current of the diode but that's pretty negligible compared to most currents we'll deal with. And then once we get back to our positive half cycle again we're going to be sort of just mirroring what our input does. So basically we have half of the information from our original input wave, everything that was above the curve. One thing to note about this, this um, output curve as well as all the other ones I'm going to draw is it does not show our, uh, the subtraction for our diode cut-in voltages. Um, I will have that in some equations and notes below, um, but it's not shown graphically here. And of course, if we wanted to do that, um, really we'd be just a little bit below this we would subtract our cut-in voltage. So this value here between, for instance, our blue and our dashed black curve would be our cut-in voltage at the gamma, or cut-in voltage at the diode V gamma. Okay, so a couple notes about our half-wave rectifier. So our peak output, so peak out would be V out is equal to our peak voltage, which remember we can write as root two VRMS, minus V gamma. So we subtract one cut in voltage because we have one diode when we are conducting through that circuit. And again, it's not shown graphically on the right sort of hump there, but on the left hump, we do see what that would look like. It'd just be reducing a value of V gamma down from the blue curve. And so remember values of V gamma are typically pretty small. So let's say this is on the order of about 0.6 volts. Uh, depending on the material of the diode, that could be as low as 0.2 or 0.3, or it could be as high as 0.8 to 1. Um, if our input voltage, if our V peak is about 10 volts or higher, that V gamma is going to be pretty negligible. But if we're talking about V inputs with peaks on the order of 4 volts, then maybe we don't want to neglect that. Okay, and so again, that V gamma is just our diode cut in voltage. Um, one other thing that we can talk about is our ripple frequency. And so our ripple frequency we're going to talk about in more detail in our next video. But for this case, our ripple frequency is the same as our input frequency. And so what this means is that's going to be harder to filter out. Um, 
because if we're trying to filter out two things, obviously it'd be ideal if we had them very far apart in frequency. That way it's easier to just choose the frequencies that we want to keep. But if they're the same, it's a lot harder to distinguish them. So this half-wave rectifier, of course, is beneficial because it only uses one diode, so it's a lot cheaper and easier to implement. Um, it's also good for low current, high voltage applications. So in general, it's good for low current and high voltage. Um, one other thing that we can note about our, our rectifier circuits that incorporate diodes is the peak inverse voltage that our diode has to see. So that's an important metric for analyzing these circuits. So peak inverse voltage, which oftentimes you'll just see abbreviated as PIV. And so there's a couple different ways you might see this, uh, and it just kind of depends on the context. You might see it as I'm gonna show it here, as peak inverse voltage that the diode will see. However, if you're looking at a data sheet and you see peak inverse voltage, that might mean that the peak inverse voltage that the diode can sustain before it breaks. Um, so again, just kind of pay attention to the context of that. Um, so we could also call this our peak reverse voltage of our diode, peak VR. And so in this case, we can see it's just going to have to sustain a negative VP. So basically it's going to have to sustain up to this negative VP when it's non-conducting. So in this case, we would just say our VR is, which is our peak inverse voltage, is square root of two VRMS. And so if we add a filter capacitor in here, which again, we'll talk about filtering in a later video, we would actually double that uh, peak inverse voltage required for this diode. Okay, so that's our half wave rectifier. So we said if we want to sort of not lose as much of this waveform, we wanna get what's happening in between T over two and T, we can use something called a full wave bridge rectifier, which has this configuration here. So notice in this circuit, now we have four diodes, so we're adding more complexity, more components, which is typically going to translate to more cost. Uh, we still have that same, we're using the same VAC that I drew up there earlier. And so now what's gonna happen is for our positive half cycle, we're going to have diodes D1 and D2 conducting. So we'll have our current going through a loop that looks like this. For our negative half cycle, we'll have our diodes D3 and D4 conducting. And so notice that the current represented by those highlighter lines was flowing the same direction through RL in both cases. So that's why I have my V out polarity labeled as you see it there. And so what we would have with that is again, sort of neglecting our, our drops, uh, our reverse, or sorry, our cut in voltage drops across our diode. Um, what we would have is we still have this going up to VP. So for our our positive half wave cycle, we're going through D1 and, and D2. And now for our negative half cycle though, instead of losing that information like we did with our half wave rectifier, we're just going through D3 and D4, but we get essentially the same thing. And then that just continues to repeat as we keep going on in time. So a couple of notes about our full wave rectifier. So we can talk about our peak output here and so again, it's not shown 100% accurately in that plot below, but our peak out, in this case, because we're going through two diodes when, our, when, when we're conducting through that load resistor, our peak V out is going to be root two VRMS, which is essentially our V peak, minus two times our cut in voltage. And the same note applies here as we talked about with the half wave rectifier. If we have a really large amplitude for our AC input, that's pretty negligible. However, once we get down on the order of five volts or so, we probably don't wanna be neglecting those diode cut-in voltages. So now with regards to the frequency, notice that compared to our input frequency, we've doubled the frequency of this output waveform. So again, we're gonna talk about ripple in a later video in more detail, but we can say that our ripple frequency is now twice the frequency of our input frequency. And so what this means is that this becomes easier to filter because like we were talking about with the half wave rectifier, uh, we want those, those frequencies to be far apart so we can more easily select what to exclude and what to include. 
Um, so this is typically good for transformer operated power supplies. Um, if we do operate it with a transformer though, we need to be careful that the secondary of the transformer is not grounded, um, or at least not grounded uh, to the same place where this resistor is grounded because we'll end up shorting out one of our diodes and it'll act like a half wave rectifier. Okay, so the next type of circuit is a full wave center tap. And so of course this is only relevant if we have uh, our AC input coming from a transformer where we can pull sort of where we have a terminal at the center of our winding on that secondary coil. And so what that looks like, notice we have two diodes. So we're kind of at a happy medium between our half wave and full wave bridge rectifier um, in terms of cost and complexity. So during our, our first for, for our positive full wave, um, we're essentially going through this D1 here and through this direction and our D2 is going to be reverse biased and then for our negative half wave we're going to be going through our D2 and through our resistor like such. So we see only half of our AC voltage is going through that resistor at any given point and that's why our maximum output voltage is going to be halved as we can kind of see from the start of this graph here. Um, so during that first half wave cycle going through D1, we have something that looks like that. Again, I'm not representing that V gamma drop. And then during the negative half cycle, we have something like that where it's going through D2 and that just continues on. So again, notice that we have full wave rectification the same way that we depicted here. Um, the only difference is up here we had this VP, whereas down here we have VP over two. Okay, so just a couple notes here. So let's also indicate our peak output. So our peak output in this case is going to be V out equals our VP over two. Well, VP I'm gonna write as root two VRMS. So VP over two, and then we're gonna subtract V gamma because for any one of those paths, for instance, our, our positive half cycle, we're only going through one diode. So we just subtract one V gamma again. Well, we can do some math and we can write that as V RMS over root two minus V gamma. So we can represent our peak output in that form. Um, once again, just like with our other full wave rectifier, our ripple frequency is now twice our input frequency. So two FN and so just like with our full wave, our other full wave rectifier, that means that this is easier to filter, which is a benefit. Okay, the last circuit we wanna look at, I don't believe we've looked at before in another class, so I might spend a little bit more time talking about how this operates. Uh, and this circuit is our voltage doubler. And so the basic operation of our voltage doubler is maybe not as obvious as with our other circuits. So let's first consider our negative half cycle. So we're talking about our negative half cycle where we are sort of down below. So let's first consider this area here in our negative half cycle. So what's going on in our negative half cycle is our D1 is reverse biased, but our D2 is forward biased. So we have our current flowing in this direction here. And so what that does is that's going to charge up our capacitor such that our capacitor is going to have a voltage approximately equal to VAC right here. And so really that's gonna be VAC minus the V gamma uh, because we have our cut in voltage of D2. But let's just approximate it as VAC for simplicity. So now once we, we switch and we are looking now at our positive half cycle, what's happening is our voltage VAC is pushing the current through this way and this capacitor has been charged up. So it's almost like another battery in series uh, with this VAC. So now our D D2 is reverse bias, so that's blocking current. So this current's gonna go through D1 uh, and then it's going to go through C2 and RL. And so this capacitor C2 is then going to get charged up to twice the voltage of VAC. So we can say this is going to be roughly to VAC. And so one thing I'm gonna write explicitly here in a little bit, uh, one drawback of this circuit is that 
it's not very stable as we change that load resistor value because as we change that load resistor value, what we're doing is we're changing our RC time constant. Um, so I should mention, let me get rid of this highlighting here. So let's say we go back to our negative half cycle now. So we've charged up this capacitor. And so now what's happening is this D1 is preventing current from this capacitor coming back into our circuit. So it's preventing it from discharging into our circuit. So essentially, we've charged up this capacitor C2 and it's just sitting here with our RL. So we have a simple RL circuit. Eventually, we know the energy from that capacitor will discharge through the resistor. How quickly depends on our RC time constant. So that's why as we adjust that R value, we're changing our RC time constant and it's gonna discharge quicker or slower. Um, and so of course, eventually we're gonna to get to another negative half cycle, we charge up C1, positive cycle, we're charging up C2. So what our output waveform is gonna look like then, let's say we've sort of come in at a stable point in the cycle. So we're charging up here and then we reach where we would have been at the peak, it switches uh, to a different um, switches to our different cycle and we're then going to be decreasing so how fast we decrease depends on um, again that RC time constant and then we switch to where we're charging up our, our voltage across C2 again so we get something that looks like that and again how much that's going up and down depends on our RC time constant this voltage at our negative peak could be dropping as low as zero if we have a really poor uh, RC time constant. Um, typically we want to keep the C2 and or the RL high enough so that doesn't happen. Okay, so a couple general notes about this circuit then. So let's come down here. So our peak output is actually going to be V out is roughly, we're going to say 2 times V peak. And remember our V peak we can write as root 2 V RMS. Uh, if we want to be a little more accurate, I didn't show it explicitly there, but we can subtract our two voltage drops uh, for our cut-in voltage on our diode because as we're charging up C1, remember we have a voltage drop from D2. So really this VAC is going to be VAC minus V gamma. And then as we're going to charge up C2, again, we have a voltage drop for our cut-in voltage in D1. So we subtract two voltage drops in total. So coming down here, we can then say our peak output is minus two V gamma. Okay, um, our ripple voltage here is actually going to be the same as our input voltage. And so I know this curve is a little harder to follow than when we just have the um, sort of the, the pure on or off that we see there. Um, but in this case, our F ripple is going to be roughly our input. And so of course that isn't as easier in terms of filtering. Uh, but we do have some inherent filtering. So notice this is a little cleaner. It's closer to a DC value um, as, com as compared to either of the, any of those other three forms. So inherent filtering would be one advantage. But like what I also talked about earlier, we have very poor load regulation with the circuit. So as we change that RL value, the behavior of this circuit or the shape of this blue curve is going to change pretty drastically as far as how far down it dips, how quickly that happens. Um, and it, of course, it's also going to change uh, if we keep our C2 and our RL values the same and we change the frequency of our input voltage, our curve shape is going to change as well. Um, one other thing to mention uh, just briefly is you might think, all right, we're doubling voltage. Um, how are we able to do that? Isn't there some kind of conservation of energy? And so that's a very good question to ask. And so, of course, we know that energy has to be conserved. And if you'll notice in the middle part, or really the whole right part of the circuit, we only have passive components. And so what that tells us is that we're not going to be adding any energy to the circuit. If we had active components like op amps or transistors, um, that's not necessarily true because of course they're biased with their own sources, that's adding more energy. But because we know our energy is the same at our input and output, if we have our voltage increasing over here at the output, so let's say over here at the output we have our voltage increasing, well, that means that our current is going to be decreasing, such that our power, which remember energy is power over time, such that our power is remaining roughly the same. So we can say if our voltage is approximately doubling, then our current is roughly one half.
And so just as a final note, we can also extend this idea instead of just having a voltage doubler, uh, we could have a voltage tripler or a voltage quadrupler, for instance. Um, so that's all for our rectification step. So hopefully most of that was a review. Um, but if you do have any questions, of course, feel free to let me know.